Te Nakoto Te Fano O Auckland Unitary. Te Nakoto Na Manahiri. No Mai Hire Mai. Hire Mai Kitene Fare Karakia Ate Atua. Te Nakoto Te Natata Katoa. As frozen earth holds the determined seed, this sacred space holds our weariness, our worry, our laughter, and our celebration. Let us bring seed and soul into the light of thought, the warmth of community, and the hope of love. Let us see together, hear together, love together. Let us worship willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and open to connection in all its forms. Hope, respect, and love, three important treasures of spiritual life. May they always be in our hearts, May we always give them generously. The light of this flame is a symbol of them. As hope, respect, and love are the cornerstones of our free religion. I invite you now to say the covenant of our congregation in your order of service. Love is the doctrine of this church the quest for truth is the sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony. Thus do we covenant with each other and with our God. And now for my random musings, I've chosen the topic as hoping just another name for magical thinking. It is difficult to deny that hope is hard to find in 2020, as the increasingly out of control pandemic keeps knocking at our door. For nearly all of us, inside or outside our unique bubble, Life has become dire, or at least more challenging and fearful. But while hope is in short supply, magical thinking seems to be having a better year. On that basis alone, they are clearly not the same. The author, Joan Didion, wrote a book called A Year of Magical Thinking, a memoir about the death of her husband two years Later, she performed a play by the same name after the death of their only daughter. Didion had been with her husband, John, for 40 years, their daughter, Quintana, for 25. Magical thinking is when you bargain your, with your God. If we sacrifice a cow, the rain will come. If I hold my breath for a minute, my football team will win, Didion writes. I stopped at the door of his closet. I could not give away his shoes. I stood there a moment and then realized why. He would need shoes if he was to return. The recognition of this thought by no means eradicated the thought, if I keep his shoes, he will come back. In church, we do a kind of magical thinking. One of our hymns begins, may nothing evil cross this door, and may ill fortune never pry. About its windows may the roar and rain go by. But we know the truth, which is that ill fortune does get in. The roar and rain of the storm do not always pass us by. And we know that singing together won't keep all the bad news out but we sing anyway. There is a passivity 
to magical thinking, like we are waiting to be saved or rescued. Magical thinking during the pandemic includes thoughts like we can open our borders and still keep the virus out. We will have a vaccine any minute now. When this is over, we can go back to living the normal lives we had before the pandemic. None of these is plausible. And as an aside, in the case of the last example, it is not necessarily even desirable. While the pandemic is certainly a case of overkill, it has served a similar purpose to rebooting your computer when the operating system is no longer functioning as intended. To have hope, on the other hand, is what an outcome is to want an outcome that makes your life better in some way. Hope not only can help make a tough present situation more bearable, but also can eventually improve our lives because envisioning a better future motivates you to take the steps to make it happen. There is nothing passive about hope. Whether we think about it or not, hope is a part of everyone's life. Everyone hopes for something, even pessimists. It is an inherent part of being a human being. Hope helps us define what we want in our futures and is part of the self-narrative about our lives. We all have running inside our minds. Having hope is important to the very act of being a human being. As Dr. Judith Rich writes, hope is a match at a dark tunnel, a moment of light, just enough to reveal the path ahead and ultimately the way out. And yet there are times when our lives feel hopeless. Despair and depression reign in our hearts. Getting out of the hole seems beyond our strength and will. At such times we might hope for something magical, like a rose in the wintertime, to restore our humanity. It is often an unlikely surprise, a surprise like the magical mystery tour a few years back. Yes, I know it sounds like a Beatles album, but this tour involved only, only one Beatle, John Lennon. And it was not actually him on tour, as he was now dead. Rather, it was his piano, on which he composed his song, Imagine spreading peace and love at the sites of tragic events. The piano toured cities like Oklahoma City, Waco, New Orleans, and Virginia Tech. Free of any restrictions, the piano was there to be touched or played by anyone. Libra Legron, whose home was destroyed by Hurricane Katrina, said, it was like sleeping in your grandpa's sweatshirt at night. Familiar, beautiful and personal. The tour director said, I never went anywhere saying this was a magic piano and it was going to cure all your ills. But she added that consistently there was a warming of even the most skeptical heart. The piano landed in Virginia a mere month after the massacre. I had no idea, she said, an inanimate object could give people so much. It turns out that Hope isn't about thinking at all, magical or not. It's about feeling. UU minister Victoria Stafford captures this reality in her poem, The Gates of Hope. Our mission is to plant ourselves at the gates of hope, not the prudent gates of optimism, which are somewhat narrower, not the stalwart, boring gates of common sense, nor the strident gates of self-righteousness, which creak on shrill and angry hinges. People cannot hear us there. They cannot pass through. 
nor the cheerful, flimsy garden gate of everything is going to be all right, but a different, sometimes lonely place, the place of truth-telling about your own soul first of all, and its condition. The place of resistance and defiance. The piece of ground from which you see the world, both as it is and as it could be, as it will be. The place from which you glimpse not only struggle, but the joy of the struggle. And we stand there beckoning and calling, telling people what we are seeing, asking people what they see. Parker J. Palmer, a Quaker elder, educator, author, activist, and founder of the Center for Courage and Renewal, agrees with Stafford. Hope is the place where joy meets the struggle. He goes on to say, of all the virtues, hope is one of the most needed in our time. When people ask me how I stay hopeful in an era of widespread darkness, I answer simply, hope keeps me alive and creatively engaged with the world. When privileged people like me choose hopelessness, he says, choose hopelessness over hope. It's not a reflection of the state of the world. It's a reflection of the state of our souls. If I were to lose hope and turn to cynicism, what would I do? Sit in the corner? Stare at the wall? Suck my thumb? Would people like me allow ourselves to become hopeless while there's so much we can do for those who are truly suffering? We need to remind ourselves that opting out is not a fit way for a grown-up to live. I take from all this that we who accept the struggle to hope become the hope of the world. It isn't magical thinking. It just is reality.
Please join me in the words in your order of service for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together. Okay, for my closing words, they're, they're a poem by Lynn Ungar. Some of you have seen her work. She's a Unitarian minister. Uh, she used to be in charge of the uh, Unitarians at large, uh, where they all met online from around the world. She has the other duties now. The poem is Afterwards. She told her granddaughter the whole harrowing story, glossing over nothing, not just the lives lost and the jobs, but also how it seemed like the world went dim when they lost dancing and singing when the theaters and stadiums and concert halls closed down, when the school playgrounds went silent. We never forgot, she assured the girl, what a hug feels like. We never stopped wanting that. But Grandma, the girl asked, how did you do it? How did you make it through? It wasn't easy, the woman replied. But at some point, we decided we were more attached to living than to our old ideas about the way things were supposed to be done.